Welcome to the Dry Bones Ministries podcast, where we strive to provide great preaching and teaching so that listeners will discover or rediscover the goodness, truth, and beauty of our Catholic faith. If you are interested in supporting the work we are doing, visit us at drybonespgh.org or follow us on social media at drybonespgh. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you're inspired, uplifted, and encouraged. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dry Bones Ministries special podcast series on the Litany of Trust. My name is Father Adam Potter, and today we pray with day 24, where our petition is that you give me the grace to accept forgiveness and to forgive others. Jesus, I trust in you. Well, we uh, come up again with the topic of mercy, of forgiveness, that's already been around in our our litany of trust so far and and today we just really ask to be fortified in this ability to both receive and to give forgiveness why is this so hard well hopefully you're not surprised at this point uh day 24 and the answer is trust (laughs) like because it's hard to trust it's hard to right to to really appreciate that with forgiveness with mercy we come to really consider those instances where either I or someone else has really wronged somebody, that I've really been wronged perhaps, where there's great damage, there's great trauma, there's great pain, there's great affliction, there's great loss, whatever it is, right? And forgiveness recognizes full well the gravity of what was, what happened, what occurred, the effects that it it had on me and then seeks to release the other person of that debt, right? That debt of the wrong that was taken and that now this other person owes. And to really forgive means that I have to be able to trust, trust in like the, there's nothing, I don't think, more vulnerable than than being able to release another person of this debt because they've already have shown me and proven that they have the ability to hurt me. And maybe this person is someone really close to me, which makes it all the more difficult when that trust is really broken and that I would seek to trust them again. And by all accounts, you know, by the breaking of this trust on a deep, deep level, they don't deserve it. They don't. Like Maybe they've shown and proven, and maybe this is a repeated thing. Um, they've shown, no, you don't deserve forgiveness. I, I can't go, go ahead and trust you. This is why I think it's amazing that Sister Faustina says, forgiveness is one of the most powerful forces in the world because forgiveness manifests the existence of a loving God. If I could say it a little bit differently, that It's one of the most powerful forces in the world because it actually manifests, makes presence, the very mercy that God shows to us who have offended God infinitely more than any of us could ever offend one another. So do you struggle with this? How hard is it to accept forgiveness? To accept forgiveness. How hard is it to forgive others? Um, yeah, I can just tell you, I'll spare the details, but not too long ago, I was confronted by someone close to me that I had hurt by my insensitivity. And I just remember that real experience of uh, just being kind of caught, caught off guard, called out. And in my pride, I still felt like I was right in what I said, but the way that I said it was again, insensitive and, um, and, and even rude. And so there was a point, there was a point to it. And as much as I wanted to like hide behind an excuse or like, well, the context was this or that, or all the while, I really just felt the Lord inviting me to be really poor and humble and to ask for this forgiveness and even to accept it, right? It's to ask for forgiveness and to accept it. How about forgiving others? How hard is that? Well, 
that can be incredibly difficult too, because what is it within us, fellow sinners, that whenever we have been wronged, hurt, and perhaps gravely so in a way that uh, has really affected the way that we see ourselves, value ourselves, are able to relate to others or be integrated into the world and to live rightly and to have this confrontation with this other person, right? And this person, that this face like is connected with this trauma and this pain and this hurt and this wrong and this loss and that they would come forward to me and ask for forgiveness. Whew. That's hard to forgive. So what is it, right, fellow sinners, that we love to think that we can hold on to that forgiveness and not give it? And as if thinking that if we just hold on to it, then we'll have some sort of power over them or we'll be able to um, feel better about it. And meanwhile, this has been my experience. Like the the more that I hold on to it, I don't never feel any better. If anything, I just feel more and more miserable about not being able to let go and to release this person. I love Psalm 25, where the psalmist prays, Look upon me, O Lord, and have mercy on me, for I am alone and poor. See my humiliation and my labor, and forgive all my sins, O my God. There's this beautiful, powerful, essential reality about forgiveness, brothers and sisters, that in the economy of forgiveness, we first need to accept God's mercy so that we can give his mercy to others. Sister Faustina says this um, very clearly on the bottom of page 152. First and foremost, we learn to trust God And in this relationship of trust, I learn to receive forgiveness, this freely given love of God for us. Then in turn, I am able to forgive others. I think one of the greatest places that we find that is in the scriptures, in the gospel of Matthew chapter 18, Jesus um, is confronted by Peter who says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Whew, how many of us can relate to that question from Peter, our first pope? Lord, is there a limit to this forgiveness, to this mercy? Like, if I'm wrong this many times, can I stop forgiving? Do I have to? For, and the Lord says, not seven times, but 77 times. And here he goes on to give what I, in my opinion, is the most insightful parable on uh, forgiveness. Maybe up there with the um, prodigal son. um, It's the parable of the unmerciful servant. In the the end, here's the summary of, of the story that hopefully you know and have heard before. It's Matthew 18, 23 and following. That there's a, a king who wishes to settle his accounts with his servants. And he brings in this one servant who realizes that he owes him 10,000 talents. And this is such an enormous debt that to, to really appreciate it, um, we need to get it out of talents. Um, 10,000 talents, I've been told, um, would actually amount to several lifetimes of, of a debt, right? If you were to break that down into the daily wage and multiply it out, he would need to live about 17 lives to pay this off. So it's immense. It's beyond what he could ever pay on his own. And so his Lord orders him, his wife, his children, and all that he had um, as payment to be made. And here the servant falls on his knees and says, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Notice how ridiculous this is. He'll never be able to repay everything. The offense, the debt that he owes to his Lord, his master, the king, is beyond what he could ever pay. And so in pity, he, the master releases him and forgives him the debt. 
Can you imagine, right? Like, oh my gosh, like those of us who know what credit card debt is like, car debt, house debt, um, mortgages, loans, how about school debt? <laughs> they could just be this incredible weight and burden and to have it immediately forgiven. It's released. It's all gone. What difference would that make in our own lives? Hopefully a lot, right? If we can really appreciate what has been forgiven us. But at that time, that same servant, he goes out and he calls upon all of his servants who owed him, um, who owed him, him debts. And there's this one servant who owes him a hundred denarii, right? In comparison to the 10,000 talents, nothing. This would have been a couple hundred days. Um, or maybe it was just a hundred. I think a denarii was uh, a day's wage. So it would have been a hundred days for this man to, to pay him back. What's the response? Here's the servant who's just been forgiven by the king, this incredible debt he could never, ever pay off. In response to this servant that says, please be patient with me and I'll pay you back. This servant says, no. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And then all of a sudden the king finds out and he calls in this servant and says this to him. You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. Notice, pay all his debt, right? That he would never be able to, it's, this is this permanent sentence of, of jail. And the concluding line is this, so, so important. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. What can we learn from this? Again, I think it's this principle of the economy of mercy that for us to be able to forgive others, we first need to be able to receive the forgiveness, the mercy of God who sees us in, in, in our own poverty. We owe God a debt that we'll never be able to pay because he's God, he's perfect, and we are finite creatures. Our sin, the smallest of sins, offends God in this infinite degree that we'll never be able to pay off on our own. And so that God, the king, <laughs> through his son, forgives us the debt, that Jesus pays a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we couldn't pay, right? That Jesus does it. He, he solves it. He pays it. And the question is, can we accept it? Can we accept it? That's what we pray for in this petition, right? That we would pray for the grace to be able to accept forgiveness. And if I can't first accept the forgiveness of God, whew, I'm not going to be able to forgive others. That just like this wicked servant, he comes across someone who owes him a much smaller debt and refuses to forgive him. How important is forgiveness? It's essential, right? So my, also my heavenly father will do to every one of you, says Jesus, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, right? Forgiveness is not just for the elite, <laughs> the spiritual elite, um, or the, the, the Catholic Marines. No, it's for everybody. We even pray this hopefully every day in the, our father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do we realize what we're praying in that, in the Our Father, that I'm actually giving God permission to forgive me in as much as I forgive others? Um, not to flip around the, the economy, right? At first, it flows from God and to others. But in as much as I would have the disposition to then ultimately be forgiven by God, I need to forgive others. I need. I have to. This is a this is a command by God. So what are what is mercy? How about some misunderstandings about mercy, about forgiveness? Here's here are three that the Lord's put on my heart to share with you today. First, there's this line about to really forgive, you also need to forget. 
forgive and forget. Like if you really forgive, then you would act as if nothing happened and move on. And I think this is, this really cheapens mercy. That that a true mercy acknowledges the full weight, the full gravity of the offense, of the loss, of the trauma. And this isn't i I'm never, I'm never going to forget. I'm going to hold it over you. It's not that, that it's not that resentment, but it's an acknowledgement of, I can forgive. I can release this other person from that offense and yet still have my mind, my intellect to be able to determine maybe I need some new boundaries in terms of how I relate to this person who's shown that they have a propensity to offend me or take advantage of me. Here's a second misunderstanding that I need to feel forgiven for it to be real. Have you ever thought this or yeah, had this temptation that I, I, I said that I, f- I forgive the person. I prayed that I forgave them. And yet I don't feel like it. Here's what we, we get from our Lord in the gospel. He says, you need to forgive your brother and sister from your heart. From your heart, right? Your heart is the seat of your will where you and I choose and decide. So true forgiveness has a whole lot less to do with whether or not we feel like we forgave them or like we've been forgiven and a whole lot more with our wholehearted free choice to forgive them. This is really important for for us whenever we ah, choose to go to confession and choose to acknowledge my sin before God or maybe go and and choose to present ourselves to a, a family member or a friend who we've offended and to ask for forgiveness, that I choose to do that, even if um, I'm still struggling maybe to really grasp the full weight of what I've done. Like, I know that I've offended this person and I need to go. And when they forgive me, I choose to accept it. And I choose to believe that, especially in the sacrament of confession, Jesus says in John chapter 20 to his disciples and their successors, those who sins you forgive are forgiven them. He gives them that authority. He gives them that power and that same power that he has given to his priests who in confession, when he says, I absolve you from your sins, we are forgiven and that we choose to believe it and to accept it. Like, well, what if I still feel guilty? It's like, okay, yeah, there are real effects that come from sin and wronging others that they can need time to heal and to allow our minds, our hearts, our memories to be healed. But just because we still have that, that feeling of guilt doesn't take away from the reality of God's mercy and that we would actually choose to believe not as much in our own subjective experience or feeling, but believe more in the promises of God who says to us through his priests, I forgive you. The last misunderstanding or misconception is that for forgiveness to be real, there needs to be reconciliation. Reconciliation, the healing of the relationship. And this is also very misleading. I would say reconciliation is another level that in God's grace and timing, real healing can come in in relationships. But that's not essential for true mercy and forgiveness to take place, that I can choose to forgive others. And by choosing to forgive them, it is forgiven. And even if that person doesn't accept it, even if that person isn't around, maybe it's not a good idea for me to approach this person uh, and to forgive them for how they've wronged me. Maybe this person has died and isn't even around anymore, right? Just because someone is dead doesn't mean that I don't have the ability to forgive them and vice versa. It also doesn't mean that I have the, like, just because they're dead doesn't mean that, oh, then I, then I can't forgive them or there's nothing to forgive. No, no, no. Like we can still hold grudges, resentments, even over the dead and how painful that would be to hold on to that 
all the way to our grave. Forgive, forgive, let go, let go of that, and to experience the the real mercy that comes from, the, sorry, the real joy and peace and freedom that comes from letting go. I love the Latin word for mercy. In Latin, the word is misericordia, misericordia. Three words, miseria, cor, dia. So Latin, um, miseria sounds like the English word misery. Cor means heart. And dia comes from the verb dare, which means to give. Right, so misericordia, mercy, literally is giving one's heart to the miserable. Isn't that great? Giving one's heart to the, to the miserable, right? To be able to see another person in the misery of how they've been wronged, to see them in their plight, in their poverty, in their humiliation, in their misery, and to give my heart, offer my heart to them. This, right, lest we just focus on ourselves, this is what God does to us. He sees us in our true misery, thinking about um, all the different moments where Jesus comes and he heals different individuals. Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 8 is a great example of Jesus seeing this paralytic lying on a stretcher. And when he sees the faith of these friends who have brought their their buddy, the, par- the paralytic, to him, he says, Courage, child, your sins are forgiven. Which sometimes I wonder, right? It's like, what? My sins? Lord, like, look at me. I'm miserable. I am suffering. I cannot move. I cannot walk. I've been affected by this my entire life. I haven't been able to engage in anything normal. I don't have any friends. I don't have any outlets. I can't run. I can't walk. I can't participate or contribute to society. Look, do you, do you not see my misery? And here's Jesus able to see a deeper misery. Not the physical, not the natural, but the supernatural misery. His sins. The darkness of his soul, the darkness of his heart, that through sin, original sin and personal sin, has actually held him captive, not in the kingdom of light, but in the kingdom of darkness. And so Jesus has the true vision to see the misery. And and then all of a sudden Jesus is able to to say, what is easier? To say your fin- your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your stretcher and go home. And he rose and went home. Right? So here's Jesus giving his heart, the very heart of infinite, perfect, selfless love to this man, seeing him in his misery, not only his physical misery, but even more so his spiritual misery. Oh, Lord, give us this grace to accept, first and foremost, your mercy and where you desire to to set us free. Friends, what keeps us? Are there any sins in our own life that we just think God couldn't forgive, that, that are too big, too beyond um, his power or his thoughtfulness or his heart? Is there anything that I've been holding on to in terms of maybe feeding it with just a guilt, um, pouring the lighter fluid of shame on, on top of the guilt too, and just to really stoke this lie that even though I've been to confession, even though I've brought it to the Lord, that I'm not forgiven Right, maybe even today is just the t- the time where we choose to accept that forgiveness from God. That His promises are real, and His church and His ministers, even as we've covered before, as fallen as they are, it's about You, Lord. It's about Your heart that is given to me through these sacraments. How about the other way around too? Are there any people in our lives that we need to forgive that we've been 
wronged by and that we might not not be afraid to to see them and their misery and to give our hearts to give our hearts in in a way that mirrors imitates the very giving of God's heart to us we so need this so that we can um yeah experience life and be restored Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amazing that these are Jesus's, some of Jesus' last words on the cross and that he is the only innocent person. Save the blessed mother, right? The only one who is innocent by his own merits. We'll, we'll qualify it that way. The only one, pure, innocent, undefiled, and yet accepting the effects of sin that are suffering and pain and death and he too wronged by each and every one of us says from the cross father forgive them and he says that to you and me right in the midst of he's not just dismissing he's not ignoring the pain of the cross that is the effects of our sinfulness not ignoring it but fully accepting it validating it as putting him to death and yet still choosing to forgive us and to release us from that uh, from that debt if we need help in that we need to take time to pray through this second invitation of sister Faustina that really lays out a formula to help us uh, forgive where she says I release you know, this person, fill in the blank, I release this person from their debt to me and I give that debt to you, Jesus. I ask you to give this person a blessing instead. That'd be a great thing to take to the Lord in prayer today and just fill in the blank of those people that we still need to forgive and and to really ask for that grace to forgive them and to hand over that debt to Jesus. Let's pray our our litany together, asking for this grace of complete trust. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The litany of trust. From the belief that I have to earn your love, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that I am unlovable, deliver me, Jesus. From the false security that I have to that I have what it takes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear that trusting you will leave me more destitute, deliver me, Jesus. From all suspicion of your words and promises, deliver me, Jesus. From rebellion against childlike dependency on you, deliver me, Jesus. From refusals and reluctances and accepting your will, deliver me, Jesus. From anxiety about the future, deliver me, Jesus. From resentment or excessive preoccupation with the past, Deliver me, Jesus. From restless self-seeking in the present moment, deliver me, Jesus. From disbelief in your love and presence, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being asked to give more than I have, deliver me, Jesus. From the belief that my life has no meaning or worth, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of what love demands, deliver me, Jesus. From discouragement, deliver me, Jesus that you are continually holding me, sustaining me, loving me. Jesus, I trust in you. That your love goes deeper than my sins and failings and transforms me. Jesus, I trust in you. That not knowing what tomorrow brings is an invitation to lean on you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are with me in my suffering. Jesus, I trust in you. That my suffering united to your own will bear fruit in this life and the next. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will not leave me orphan that you are present in your church. Jesus, I trust in you. That your plan is better than anything else. Jesus, I trust in you. That you always hear me and in your goodness always respond to me. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me the grace to accept forgiveness and to forgive others. Jesus, I trust in you. That you give me all the strength I need for what is asked. Jesus, I trust in you. That my life is a gift. Jesus, I trust in you. That you will teach me to trust you. Jesus, I trust in you. That you are my Lord and my God. 
Jesus, I trust in you, that I am your beloved one. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode. To learn more about Dry Bones Ministries, events, and initiatives, and to support this podcast, go to drybonespgh.org. Thanks, and God bless you.